Hi, this is Phoenix, and I'd like to talk about some of my thoughts on the unconscious mind. Um, in modern psychology, uh, the unconscious mind, at least as defined by Freud, and Freudian psychology has been debunked. Nonetheless, I'm going to think through the Freudian tradition uh, to come up with my own conclusions about um, the unconscious mind. And so, what do I mean by the unconscious mind? Well, I'm certainly thinking of uh, thoughts such a, um, of the conception of the unconscious mind as um, including thoughts, perceptions, ideas, etc., um, that are beneath uh, our conscious mind, beneath our awareness, um, but that exist nonetheless. Now, I'm not worried so much about how um, these unconscious thoughts uh, and the like, and how the unconscious mind as a whole um, impacts and affects our behavior. Um, or determines our behavior, I should say. There, I'm concerned about how it uh, affects our behavior. But I'm also concerned about the um, unconscious thoughts and perceptions, etc., that exist. Um, real fast, there's a concept called psychic determinism, which is the fear that uh, because we are unaware of our unconscious thoughts, um, our behavior is determined by those unconscious thoughts, um, but they essentially control us um, without our awareness. Um, I want to say real fast that I'm not going to go that far, uh, but that I do think that our unconscious thoughts do indeed affect our behaviors in ways that we're not aware of. Um, so, so how, um, what would be the best way to talk about the unconscious mind and what that means uh, based off the general framework that I've started off with so far? Well, um, certainly you have David Foster Wallace, or at least an idea that is often attributed to David Foster Wallace, which is the notion that people that are very, very introspective, in other words, people who are trying to access um, their unconscious thoughts, their unconscious perceptions, etc., um, uh, those people are um, brimming with a kind of self-importance. And so, of course, it's a kind of a jab at people who are introspective and people who have that kind of depth. Now, I think this is a, an unfair assessment. I think this is an unfair claim because I think um, just because you're introspective um, and are not necessarily um, an extrovert doesn't mean that you're um, impotent in certain ways. It doesn't mean that you are self-important um, and the like um, because I do indeed think that it takes a certain kind of intelligence to be introspective. And the reason why I say that is because think about the process of introspection. The process of introspection is trying to understand our uh, ourselves via reflection um, and trying to understand um, our thoughts via reflection. And that may be why David Foster Wallace would see that as a kind of self-importance because it's essentially an obsession with the self. But the problem that I have with that claim is that it undercuts and undermines the importance of that kind of introspection. And the importance of that introspection is um, understanding yourself in a way that can make you a more uh, functional, a more functional being. So instead of just repressing um, all of your ideas, um, all of your concepts, all of your experiences and the like, you're actively trying to confront them. So here the, here's a couple thoughts to kind of illustrate this point. Um, first off, uh, I came to a philosophical claim that essentially we are defined by our faults. Um, I posted this on Facebook and I tried to generate discussion. Um, suffice to say, it generated the wrong kind of discussion to a degree because a lot of people didn't understand what my point was with um, going with such a bold uh, philosophical idea, um, such a negative idea. But the reason why was because that was a way of confronting um, certain thoughts that I had in my mind. Now, so that's, that's an example. I think that uh, even though this is a literary example, it's also relevant. Um, the literary example is William Faulkner's Sound and the Fury and uh, the emphasis of painful memories um, as illustrated and described and depicted via the characters in the book. And I would say um, that that is what makes Sound and the Fury so uh, revolutionary is its emphasis on the painful memories and using the form and structure of the novel and the stream of consciousness writing in order to um, represent um, and manifest the painful memories that are often repressed. And so um, 
even though it definitely is very uh, indicative of Freudian psychology, it's done in a very artistic way. And it's obviously related to Freudian psychology in the way that we um, tend to um, essentially uh, repress our memories and specifically repress the painful memories and the painful ideas, perceptions, concepts, etc. that we have in our mind. Now it's interesting what got me thinking about all of this um, because uh, as I like to do I often um, introspect and one day I was introspecting, this was just recently, I was introspecting and thinking uh, seriously about things and certain issues and reflecting and um, I was amazed at how um, a certain uh, what could be called a stimuli in the exterior world was able to essentially stir up so many um, unrelated and yet related ideas that were very very painful and so again like I said when I was trying to confront um, something uh, something that was dark about myself something that was troubling but important to be confronted which was the idea that um, that philosophical idea that I talked about about how we um, should be defined by our faults um, and how that caused problems um, uh, so how do I say this um, the ideas were certainly painful um, the idea was certainly painful and problematic and I realized it was the same thing with these ideas that I was thinking about that were stirred um, and brought to the forefront because essentially what we want to do is we want to um, to not confront our unconscious mind and we don't want to confront the things that cause us suffering um, even if only unconsciously the things that cause um, mental pain um, and mental torment because we think that it's inappropriate um, as happened with my example earlier that I mentioned um, and people are often afraid of it and they're often um, unwilling to confront it with you so to speak confront that inner darkness but I think that that's important um, and but I think that it's a difficult process and I think that's why a lot of people don't engage in it you know so simple introspection and reflection um, and so like I said uh, to go back to the example that I was talking about earlier um, so there was a stimuli that happened that evoked all of these um, painful memories and the painful implications um, and ideas that came along with that and I had to confront it because I knew that to not confront it would be um, would cause me to commit the moral fallacy of bad faith and I wasn't about to do that um, so I ended up confronting my ideas um, and confronting these painful memories to try to come to some kind of truth and to some kind of realization now to go back to literature I would say this is what makes Dostoevsky brilliant as well is his ability to use philosophy as a way of introspecting and as a way of reflecting um, and I'm just mentioning that because it's difficult you know if you think about the dark subject matter that Dostoevsky writes about you can only imagine how difficult it was to be able to tap into those themes but it's because of that willingness to want to confront the unconscious mind and so if there's anything that I would want um, anyone to take away from these ideas is that that's what we need to do is we need to confront our unconscious mind um, sometimes we do that with simple ways uh, without even being aware of it uh, via expression whether that's expression through art whether it's expression through talking but what I realized um, when the stimuli uh, was slowly stirring up all of these painful memories and thoughts about my life that I had to confront what I realized is how hard it how hard of a process it is to be able to confront the unconscious mind and it's difficult to confront the unconscious mind because it brings up so many unpleasant things nobody wants to think about the time that they were abused as a kid for instance and what that means for their life and what it means for them today and so we actively repress it in fact this was something that Freud struggled with was um, our constant uh, our constant um, battle between repressing uh, repressing things such as painful memories um, or acting aggressively to try to um, manifest those um, the emotions that come with such painful memories um, in real life and he was troubled by that notion by that hopeless um, way in which we're as humans confounded which is um, the push-pull between aggression and repression and how it seems like there's only one choice or there's only those choices to act on and so again to go back to my point this is the thing about the unconscious mind is that it's very difficult to first off even apprehend and understand um, which is why it's unconscious um, but the thoughts are there 
and they do affect us in ways that we're not even aware of. And that, that, that's certainly something that we have to be prepared for and ready for. But I think that it's an important process. And I think that's something that we uh, take for granted because um, we're not sure how to do it because we are, under, we are aware that it's hard to confront these ideas. It's hard to be honest with them. It's hard to work through them. Um, but even though this will probably sound a little bit uh, um, too in line with um, modern psychiatric practices, I think it's healthy that we do this. Um, and this is going to sound a little um, antithetical to modern psychi psychiatric practices because I'm about to take that claim a little bit um, to uh, make that claim a little bit more extreme. But essentially the idea is that um, we should even obsess about these things. Um, we shouldn't obsess out of any kind of need to um, be self-important as David Foster Wallace fears and warns us about, but we should do it because we want to thoroughly understand what is causing us um, the kind of anxiety and pain uh, that is being caused. And so just to keep in mind, the unconscious mind houses as I would imagine, um, many different things. So it houses our experiences, whether past or present. It houses our perceptions. Um, it houses thoughts and our thoughts. It houses ideas. It houses philosophies. It houses concepts. And so it houses all of these things, um, as well as feelings and desires, um, motives. And so all of this gets mixed in this complicated uh, cesspool, but a necessary cesspool. And the trick is to reach through the cesspool and try to find, um, try to find the truth, and try to find the gold. And so, again, even though I've come to this point a lot, um, I think it's important that I drive it home, which is that we work hard to try to um, wrestle with the unconscious mind, because once we can um, pull out the things that are buried deep within um, our mind and that we're not aware of, um, I think we can accomplish amazing things because we can confront things about ourselves uh, that can not only help us move on and heal. Um, and so it's cathartic in a sense, um, and progressive. Um, but it also just lets us come to the conclusion that we are, um, we are someone of worth. We are someone of value and everything that is housed in our unconscious mind is something that is, um, essentially, uh, essentially we can allow it to define us and be part of us. Um, again, this is Phoenix and thank you.